Um, my name is Richard Joy. I'm the executive director of the Urban Land Institute Toronto, and I'm very pleased to present this, our third in a series, um, the Future of Cities uh, discussion series with um, Ryerson City Building Institute. Um, we've uh, enjoyed two uh, previous really great sessions, and uh, the, the interest in this Earth Day is uh, is tremendous. And uh, so I should I should say as a start off, Happy Earth Day to everybody. Um, it's a very interesting time to be celebrating Earth Day, of course, um, making for an interesting context for this conversation. Um, if we could just uh, uh, go forward one slide, a uh, couple of housekeeping things. First of all, everybody will be, not surprisingly, muted all the way through this, this uh, uh, call, just because we have so many people dialing in. Um, if you do want to submit questions, and we encourage you to do so, um, there is the question uh, and answer function. Um, we um, really appreciate people submitting questions, um, but we probably won't be able to get to a good many of them um, just because of the, the amount of time that we have. But know that um, those questions are important even if we don't get to address them live. They will become part of, of the, uh, the uh, 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 thinking for future webinars that we may explore down the road. And we're exploring quite a few, as, you're, as you may have noticed, if you're a loyal ULI follower. Um, this is being recorded um, and uh, uh, also uh, so you can listen to it at a later date or people who haven't been able to dial in at this time will be able to listen to it at a later date. Um, and if you're tweeting, please use the hashtag future of cities. Next slide. Um, really important uh, thank yous to our annual sponsors. Um, it's always important for an organization like ULI Toronto to have such sponsorship. Um, but it has never been more important than during this highly disruptive time. Um, our, our, you know, we, we exist um, in large part because of our ability to present live events and, and various uh, things that involve audience um, and event sponsors, and none of that can happen anymore. Um, we are doing these events uh, um, in a way that, that only can be viable with the base foundation uh, support of our annual sponsors. So we're grateful to them um, for their support. The next thing I want to do just before I, I turn over to Cherise Berda um, is to point you to two really interesting uh, webinars that are coming just this week. Um, tomorrow, uh, Richard Florida, uh, who's been writing a lot on how cities can reopen after the pandemic, um, will be a fascinating, we're co-producing this with the Board of Trade. Um, and uh, this is this is I think I want be one you won't want to miss. We've got a lot of people signed up for that already. One that we don't have a lot of people signed up for, but I think is a very fascinating conversation. And maybe people haven't quite understood what it is by the way it's marketed. But we have um, the CEO of Colliers Canada, uh, Brian Rosen, uh, with the CEO of the Americas for the Americas of IWG. Um, who for many of us is better known as the parent company of Spaces, which is um, one of the major co-working uh, companies uh, operating uh, in the world and in Canada. And the future of co-working, I think, is one of the most interesting conversations that, that, that uh, we, we could present um, because of, of the physical distancing uh, legacy that will likely last long past uh, um, the immediate uh, spike that we're going through with, with COVID-19. Um, so please, if you are, uh, can, uh, dial into that, uh, uh, log into that uh, webinar. I think it will be really, really interesting. Uh, and that's at 12 to 12.45 on Friday. So with that advertising all out of the way, I'm sorry to take up a bit of time, uh, Cherise. I really do want to flip it to you now. Um, so if, next slide um, is, uh, and Cherise, you're going to introduce our, our great panel. Um, but it's a, it's a great pleasure to work with you again um, on this, the future of climate and city building. Um, over to you, Cherise. Thank you, Richard. And for those of you who are just tuning in, thank you for joining us for the third session of our Future of Cities series. And in this series, we bring together Ryerson experts with external industry professionals. And uh, today is a special Earth Day discussion on the future of climate and city building. And for today's session, we're joined by an exceptional panel that I'm pleased to introduce. So next slide, please. So first, we have Roya Halili, 
who is Sustainable Design Manager for Minto Communities. Roya has worked on over 30 residential projects across the GTHA. She's provided input on the evolution of the Toronto Green Standard and Energy Star for multifamily high-rise programs and was recognized as the Inner Quality Leader of the Year for 2018. So Roya, thank you for sharing your tremendous experience on this topic with us today. Welcome. And next slide, um, Jenny McMinn is Managing Director at Urban Equation, a consultancy focused on innovation and sustainable development. And Jenny leads Urban Equation's real estate and sustainability consulting practice. And prior to this, Jenny spent nearly a decade at Hall Saul Associates, now WSP, leading the creation of award-winning, high-performance green building and community design projects. So thank you for bringing your expertise to the panel today, Jenny. And next slide, finally, our Ryerson expert, someone I have the great fortune of working with as much as possible, Dr. Pamela Robinson, Director and Professor in Ryerson School of Urban and Regional Planning and a Registered Professional Planner. As part of the geothink.ca research team, her research, teaching, and practice focus on urban sustainability issues, in particular cities and climate change, and the use of open data and civic technology to support government transformations. Thanks for being here, Pamela. Thanks to you all. Okay, great. So we have about 25 minutes of moderated questions followed by a 15 minute Q&A. So let's get started. Um, Jenny, I'm gonna turn to you first. Um, can you kick off this discussion um, by helping us understand where we are at today in terms of climate action and city building. So what progress has or has not been made? Essentially, what's our jumping off point right now? Sure, thank you, Cherise, and um, thanks to all the attendees for making time today, um, especially screen time, I uh, appreciate it, and um, very excited to see such a positive response, uh, especially on Earth Day. Um, so yeah, in terms of where we're at, uh, this might be stating the obvious, we're in a global crisis. The one that we're talking about, right, hopefully the most right now um, in its urgency and uh, immediate impact is the coronavirus. But the other underlying crisis upon us is climate change. Um, and, you know, we are currently using and depleting the Earth's resources at an increasingly rapid rate. In Canada, we're currently using about five planets worth of resources. Globally, we use about two planets worth of resources. And we could pause here and have a whole nother lecture just about uh, ecological and planetary footprinting, but certainly even understanding those numbers, it's obvious that we are consuming much more than the earth can naturally produce for us and that it varies across the globe. And so, um, you know, while that is very daunting and I think, uh, I think in sense a lot of fear and anxiety for most of us in the real estate sector as to how do we how do we live more equitably and within uh, within the planet's resources and what I find interesting through this uh, challenge that we're currently in is that we we've learned quite a lot uh, as we've been navigating through the coronavirus and I think we're seeing how much change is possible. Um, and that that was really as of a few maybe six weeks ago that amount of change seemed inconceivable and that amount of change is what we do need to act adequately address climate change and so what I think is exciting is we can see that government can take leadership you know we can act as globally conscientious and local citizens um, and that I do think people want to do right and so in our day-to-day -day work, we're regularly working with developers and policymakers to try and adjust, address just that. How do we um, achieve this change to be building um, and living in communities within our planetary uh, footprint um, and doing that in a way that we can continue to live happy and healthy lives? Um, you know, I think the key aspect to doing that is really looking at ourselves as builders as a, a one piece within a network of players that are required to create these thriving communities in an economical way. And so, you know, one, one example of the work that we're doing that shows that this amount of change is possible is the Baker District in Guelph, where 
we are using a tool called the One Planet Living System to help us understand how much uh, resources the members, the residents, and the occupants within that community will be using. And that requires both us as developers that we're investing um, in building technologies and uh, setting up for access to sustainable food in a meaningful way, but it will also ask the city of Guelph to act as well as all the folks that move in. So while it's quite daunting the amount of work ahead of us uh, to hit, um, uh, to be living more conscientiously, we think there's lots of great ways to do it and we're excited to um, talk with the other panelists today and, and, and learn more. Thanks for that overview, Jenny. It's staggering um, some of the figures, the five planets in Canada, it's amazing. And um, so it makes us think, even, do, even though we're doing some great stuff, we're not hitting the mark, clearly here in Canada. And, you know, it sounds like we've been trying to advance green, low carbon, urban innovation and city building for years now. But with relatively slow market uptake, because there hasn't been any perceived urgency and the status quo works for the market and it meets the regulatory requirements and it's profitable. Yet, as you mentioned, during this pandemic, we've seen all levels of government enact swift policy and private sector turn on a time and implement operational change to address COVID-19. So turning over to Roya, building on this, in your opinion, can this experience right now provide an opportunity to actually shift gears towards climate action? Um, yeah, thanks for the question and thanks again for asking me to join the conversation. Um, so first, I'd like to acknowledge that we are still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think in the immediate time frame, of course, our focus is going to be on minimizing the impact to people's lives and our livelihoods. Um, but I want to draw some similarities between the pandemic and climate change. So this pandemic, similar to climate change, really is a single issue that impacts and therefore aligns all of us. Um, we're seeing that there are no borders and it is a global issue. Um, with this pandemic, as with climate change, the science has indicated to us for years that we're at risk of significant impacts to how we're living if we're not proactive. And um, I'm sure many of you have seen the uh, five years ago, Bill Gates in his TED talk on the next outbreak, he quoted that the World Bank estimate, um, if we were to have a worldwide flu pandemic, would be around $3 trillion, which at that time was about 4% of the GDP. And today, in the middle of COVID-19, it's still too difficult to estimate what the financial impact is going to be. Um, now, the current estimates of financial impact from climate change range significantly. Um, but on the higher end, it's between 15 to 25% of the GDP. So it's significant. And that's not even touching on the impact to people's lives. Um, however, one of the key differences between the two is that they really are on two different timescales. We're experiencing the impact of COVID-19 acutely. It's abrupt um, and we're experiencing the consequences very quickly. While we have been and we're, we're going to continue experiencing the impacts of climate change very gradually um, over many generations, the outcomes are going to be similar. Um, unless we take action, the consequences are going to be costly, profound and life changing. Um, so the good news is that we're going to get through it. Uh, and like with any major crisis, we can expect to see major innovations. Um, from history, the greatest example that we're familiar with in city building is how the severe cholera outbreak in London, England in the 1850s led to drinking water and sanitation infrastructure. Um, but I think the swift change being enacted in most cases right now is reactionary because we just weren't prepared for this. Um, while at the same time, um, it is showing that what was perceived as a barrier can in fact be overcome. Um, if we look at working from home, for example, there were numerous perceived barriers to, to why this was going to be a challenge. Um, and overnight, many of us have shifted to this way of working. 
and I'll speak for myself and say that it's been a, it's been a bit awkward at first, um, but now we're discovering efficiencies and wider reaching benefits that we didn't initially anticipate. Um, we are having to pause as we drastically change how we live. And this pausing offers a change of perspective. Um, I think the, the natural conditioned response is gonna, it's gonna be to wanna keep things the same. Um, but I think it's more likely that we are gonna see a new norm emerge. Um, and the biggest opportunity lies in deciding how we wanna move forward. And it's the people in business today and in positions to influence policy that are really gonna be shaping what that new norm looks like. Um, the financial stimulus over the next few years is gonna be setting the direction of our economy into the future. And so this is the time for us to be thinking and acting really big. Um, I read that the, the mayor of Milan said that, of course we wanna reopen the economy, but we think we should do it on a different basis from before. We think we have to reimagine Milan in the new situation. And with that, they announced yesterday, the city of Milan announced yesterday that 35 kilometer, kilometers of streets will be transformed um, to better support cycling and walking space. Now, this was something that they had planned into the future, but they fast tracked it. Um, and so what we can do is to choose to look to science for the facts, to continue to build on the collaborations that are underway um, and as we problem solve to really find those solutions th that address both health and wellness and climate change simultaneously. Okay, great. Thanks, Roya. We're going to get into that. Um, next slide, please, when we um, speak with Pamela. Um, so Pamela, in the last few weeks, what do you think are some of the key areas where you have seen um, these health actions in response to COVID-19 and climate issues intersecting? So the example that we heard from Roya is um, how you can reallocate road space to pedestrians and cyclists to move more safely, which is also a climate action. So. Um, what do you think are some of the um, opportunities right now that could lead to fundamental shifts in planning and policy? Thanks, Sharice, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. You know, I think the part that's really humbling for all of us who work in planning and design and city building is that what COVID-19 has done is it's just laid to bear all of the things that we knew were already challenging to begin with, whether it was affordable housing or challenges around mobility or dealing with issues around inequity across our cities. These aren't new issues to us, but COVID, as Mary Rowe from Canadian Urban Institute said, is the great particle accelerator to show us all the challenges that, that we're facing. And for me as a planner, you know, one of the great reckonings that I'm thinking through in this time of pausing and thinking is all of our focus on building livable cities has really um, accelerated the need and the demand for excellent public and civic infrastructure. And what we're seeing right now is that the public and civic infrastructure we have, we don't have enough of it. And when we impose a challenge like social distancing upon it, it's really buckling under the pressure. And so one of the things I think we need to think through is we, we plan ahead both for, for climate change and its impacts, but also future pandemics and other public health challenges are how do we think about a resiliency strategy for civic spaces that we usually rely on, things like libraries and parks and open spaces when they're not available and where will we turn when those things don't exist? I think the good piece or the good news piece of this is that, and this picks up on what Roya said about City of Milan, Milan's using the time to pause and think about the city they want. We've got this great technique called backcasting, you know, where instead of forecasting current conditions into the future, what we do instead is figure out the future we want and then chart a path on how to move towards it. And we're in good shape when it comes to the intersection between climate change and, and, and civic action, I think in part because what we have in Canada is a long history of local government and communities taking meaningful action that actually led in the first place to greenhouse gas emission reductions beginning as early ago as 1988 when we had the Toronto um, International Conference on the Changing Atmosphere it was 32 years ago we started to take action. So municipal governments are really well positioned and so are municipal government partners in the form of land developers and, and not-for-profit organizations. We also have a good history here. It's not widespread, but we have done some interesting urban experimentation. I don't know how many people remember back 
in 2005 and 6 when Waterfront Toronto temporarily closed Queen's Quay to show that we could have a different way of moving people and moving cars um, and moving transit along King's, Queen's Quay. They invested a million dollars and, and changed the mobility patterns down there as an experiment, did the evaluation. Now we have the Queen's Quay movement system that we have. And so we can draw from previous experience and previous knowledge and also use the time we have to really double down on thinking about who we wanna be moving forward in the future that we need to have that both addresses greenhouse gas emission reductions, but also deeply considers climate adaptation strategies that will re improve resiliency and equity across our cities. Great, thanks, Pamela. Um, before I move back to Jenny, I just wanted to note that the rendering you see here on the slide is the project that re Jenny referenced, the Baker District project that's pursuing zero carbon in, in Guelph. So it looks great. So um, back to you, Jenny. Um, looking ahead um, to longer term COVID-19 recovery efforts and federal stimulus investment, what do you see as the biggest opportunities to address climate, health, and city building goals together with economic recovery? And what priorities should be baked into city building stimulus funding and recovery efforts? Thanks, Maria. Um, yeah, there's lots of great comments already from the panel and, and certainly I think a great opportunity to um, proactively invest and plan um, instead of waiting and responding to a more acute uh, challenge uh, as we've been most recently doing with COVID. Um, and, and I think, you know, I re was reflecting as I was preparing for this a little bit and um, really trying to understand and, and um, grapple with my own footing and how I've navigated through the uh, uh, the COVID epidemic. And, and I think it helps to pause a little bit and think about um, and label the emotional response that we've collectively gone through. And this does eventually get back to political leadership. But I think when we actually understand the, that we've collectively gone through a process of grief, um, you know, loss of normalcy, the fear of the economic toll and, and our loss of connection to one another, it's interesting to think about those stages of, uh, that we've just gone through, all of us probably at a different one of, you know, denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, acceptance, and meaning and and what I think is interesting when we try to place climate change on that trajectory is that I think for the most part while governments are trying to scratch the surface uh, around climate change the meaningful investment hasn't yet been there and I would say that we're still collectively really in a bit of a state of denial well there are definitely folks who are stretching and demonstrating you know beyond that but I think it's just kind of important to understand where we are as, as a collective and I think you know, um, what we've recognized, and I hope that uh, government leadership picks up, is that as a society, we have endured quite a lot of change and that we can do that. And that I think there will be more willingness and interest in the proactive planning um, that we've seen some leaders, as Roya mentioned in Milan, um, planning and anticipating and using this opportunity to actually think about what value do we want to inject back into our economy? You know, I think there is an absolute need and an opportunity to really think about um, how can we better protect our resources and our economic planning. And so I think that's the, that's the launch pad really by which I hope our leaders will, uh, will pause and think about how do they apply this stimulus. And I think that it's certainly that all government uh, funding moving forward should really be tying back to their own climate objectives. Um, and I, I think that there are lots of existing tools. We don't necessarily need to create new ones, um, but that the key aspect is ensuring that there's a quality check, which is how is this project reducing greenhouse gas emissions? How is this project better enabling community involvement and engagement? And so some specifics around that is you know the Feder the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has some tools and mechanisms in place right now. There's quite a lot of federal money that's flowing through uh, FCM right now, and while it's accessible to municipalities, it can be a bit clunky of getting both the private sector and uh, municipalities mm -hmm. together to best leverage that. But there are some examples, and I hope that FCM will step up and find creative ways to deploy the capital that they have 
to really get deeply into uh, the development industry. I also think that um, grants and funding to incent pilot projects is critical and we want those projects to demonstrate um, that carbon uh, neutral, neutral or carbon positive is possible. We are a conservative sector in real estate. Um, we like to see things built successfully a few times. And so I think there's a real need to, um, to help provide that kind of first or newer to market uh, projects uh, with the funding they need to get up and off the ground. And then lastly, I would say that, well, the gov well, we certainly want leadership to step up by way of government. That's not enough either. We need to be firing from all cylinders, so to speak. And so I hope there will be more opportunities for public-private partnerships where we can leverage the nimbleness of the private sector um, uh, and combined with secure impact-oriented financing or grants. I, I think there's an opportunity as well, both in the real estate sector and without, where most companies um, and businesses are, they get it. resiliency planning is upon us. And so while all of these, uh, all of our uh, prospective residents uh, or um, business office occupants are going to be asking a lot more from their real estate. And I think that's a real opportunity whereby I think uh, as businesses or individuals, I think that out of this, people are going to be looking for more meaning and more purpose from all of their purchases, including where they choose uh, to purchase or rent uh, real estate. So there's a real opportunity and we all need to, all, all three aspects need to act, I think, to move us forward in the way uh, that's needed. Well, that's a great blueprint forward. Thank you for that, Jenny. And um, I just want to advance to the next slide and we're going to keep the conversation going with two more questions and then we're going to turn to Q and A's and just um, a note to everybody out there who has burning questions. There's a Q and A function um, that you can access on the bottom of your screen and there's some questions coming in right now but please um, feel free to um, type some of your questions to the panel for the Q&A um, part of the discussion. So um, keeping things going, um, back to you, Pamela. What are some of the specific local opportunities here in Toronto in terms of how to use this big public investment in recovery efforts and to create a new normal for city economies based on reducing pollution and poverty, improving public health, and increasing resilience to shocks, be it health or climate crises? Thanks, Sharice. I, you know, I think just to pick up on, on Jenny's conversation about leadership, the most important thing that we need to do locally is to make the public investments that, that are going to come from the federal government work as hard as possible locally to achieve benefits across community environment and economy. And so by stacking the benefits and the impact, we need to think about how are we gonna use the stimulus spending to create good work opportunities for people at good wages? And how are we gonna extend those opportunities to more people? How are we gonna use the money to both create good local and immediate environmental benefits and ones that extend into the future in terms of climate action? And also, how are we gonna spend the money as close to home as possible to try to make sure that that money lands federally at local and community scales. And so um, there are a couple of really interesting examples that I'll, that I'll share. One is a small social enterprise called Building Up. Building Up works with people who have traditionally had a very hard time finding work, whether because of, of previously compromised mental health challenges or because they've been involved um, with the penal system in Canada. Um, and they take people and train them how to do um, small scale contracting and also um, water conservation retrofits. And so building up is training people who otherwise wouldn't have these kinds of skills to do the work. They're being paid a decent wage and they're doing this work in all kinds of large scale buildings including Toronto um, community housing buildings. So the building um, infrastructure benefits that come from working with building up extend to people who are living in public housing. And so this is a really good example of a kind of investment that creates work opportunities, environmental benefits, improved quality of life for more people, um, but also just results in the job getting done. And so for anybody working on the contracting side at the small scale, you might want to look to social enterprises like building up to try to build those kinds of partnerships because you would have paid for the toilets to be replaced anyway. Why not make that investment in a social enterprise where you're going to get win-win-win outcomes 
At a larger scale, you know, City of Toronto has the Better Buildings Partnership, which has functioned with Toronto Atmospheric Fund funding for a long time. And it's been a revolving loan fund that continues to make heating, air conditioning, and ventilation system um, retrofit opportunities available to, to building owners. And you don't pay up front for the infrastructure, but you pay instead for the infrastructure by a reduction in your utility bill over time. And so there's another good example of how government investment in funds has been leveraged to extend quite a long distance. For people who want to learn more about interesting work that's happening, particularly around community wealth building and how to use the stimulus funding to create local economic development benefits, can look towards um, organizations like the Atkinson Foundation, who's released work on, on community wealth building. Metcalf Foundation, where I serve on the board, has a very interesting and impactful series of nature-based climate solutions, along with World Wildlife Fund, who's doing this work at scale across the country. So we have lots of good real world examples of how to make that money work harder. And that's the leadership challenge that we all face. Great, thanks Pamela. Um, so we're just going over, but we have time for our final question to Roya, and then we'll go to Q and A. So, um, so Roya, um, rounding this up, has, has COVID-19 changed the way that you define or the way that we should all rethink the terms resilience or livable when it comes to city building? And how might developers approach these ideas in their work going forward? Um, sure, so I'm gonna focus on uh, redefining resilience. Um, typically resilience at the city building level has focused on adaptation to local climate change. And so in Toronto, that has meant um, higher incidence of flooding and more days that require cooling. Uh, the city of Toronto actually already has a resilience checklist. And I think once we re refine what we have to do to better, better support resilience around the COVID pandemic, I think that can be updated. Um, but, but I think what, what the situation is causing is that the boundaries of what we include in this concept of resilience are really expanding. Um, and they're including public health and wellness, community and resource and independence. So a lot of those concepts, which um, typically are not included in resiliency um, because it has focused very much around climate change are starting to make, the, make their way into the discussion. But again, I'm going to say, since we're still in the midst of the pandemic, I, I think it's too early to know the specific measures that are going to be required at a city building level. Um, when we look at how, my, how developers can approach these ideas going forward, I think the, the good news is that when it comes to um, carbon reduction, around climate change, there, there are many tools, as Jenny mentioned, um, and solutions that are already, already available. So my messages to, to developers are more about capacity building internally. Um, so number one, I would say, be open to changing the status quo. Um, building a culture of innovation internally means being comfortable with trial and error knowing that in the long term, the benefits are going to outweigh the losses. And the aim really is for a business in which people are engaged and comfortable with what I like to call a measured degree of risk. Um, number two, uh, build capacity internally to address the range of issues that fall within this idea of resilience. Um, I think empowering a few key people we, we've had success with that, empowering a few key people within the organization uh, to have a clear mandate to support that integration of the resilient strategies throughout the business. And some concrete examples that, that we've been working with are, um, for example, using an energy model as a design tool for the architects um, or guiding the development team through building a more resilient stormwater management strategy or setting air tightness targets for the homes that we're building and, and leaving it up to the construction teams to figure out how they're gonna get there. Um, so, so yeah, th those are some capacity building internal pieces. Um, number three, I think take advantage of industry experts. Very quickly, you know, the city of Toronto is on a trajectory towards net zero ready buildings. Um, 
it's, it's a stepped trajectory and that's aligned with where BC is going. Um, and we know we're familiar with the DC refund, which incentivizes those higher tiers of, of the Toronto Green Standard specifically. Now, these better buildings, they reduce operational energy consumption and carbon emissions, yes, um, but they also offer healthier and more comfortable spaces for people to live. And in addition to the operational carbon emissions, we're finding more and more that this idea of embodied carbon is making, is making its way into the, into the discussion um, of, as a really important design consideration. But you know, often we ask, well, how do we actually build those, build those buildings? Um, and I think initiatives like the Enbridge Savings by Design charrettes have provided really valuable support to us in figuring out how to get to those higher levels of, of building performance. Um, and the charrettes also do touch on wider sustainability issues. It's not always just focused on building performance. Um, we've gotten into health and wellness on, on a number of them. And the value that we've gotten the most value out of these charrettes um, by making sure that they're a consistent part of our design process. One, we run them early is two. And three, we involve people in them that are really committed to finding a way to build on the learning. And number four is going to be upskilling people to support that new normal that we want to settle into. And I'm going to do a really quick plug for inner quality. Um, so for the first time ever, Enerquality's acclaimed high-performance new construction workshops are going to be available online and free for Ontario home builders, which is huge. Uh, for everyone else in Canada, they're just going to be a fraction of their regular price. Um, and that's thanks to a range of sponsors. And the courses on offer are Advanced Building Science, Energy Star for New Homes, and the CHBA's Net Zero Labeling Program. Spaces are limited, so register now at enerquality.ca. Um, as we adjust to the new normal, I believe that the financial investments should go towards supporting initiatives that address multiple objectives. So upskilling people and creating jobs that support a more resilient future. And I'm, I'm gonna wrap up. <laughs> I know we, we've got to get to the questions, but I wanna wrap up with an African proverb. Um, it, was, it was shared at the end of the one World Together at Home online concert, which was held on Saturday night. And I was struck by how appropriate it was for today's webinar. For tomorrow belongs to the people who prepare for it today. Great, thank you so much. That's a great way to wrap up the discussion. And I wanna thank all of you. Um, I've learned a lot from this and um, so many fantastic examples. We have, I think we have time for one, maybe two questions um, from the audience. And I'm just scrolling through them. I wanted to note that there was a question about transit and I'm gonna pass that one. I'm gonna pass on that one because we um, are planning to have a, an upcoming webinar about transit in Toronto. So stay tuned for that one, Kimberly. Um, and then Taro, um, Continen, um, sorry if I didn't pronounce that right, Taro, um, hi. Um, you had a question about um, Amsterdam and the fact that I was reading about this as well, that they, um, they've used this time to reevaluate their strategies and are considering um, the donut economic sustainability model for city building after the pandemic is over. So before I ask this question to the panel, um, I'm going to throw it to Pamela because um, Pamela, I'm guessing that you know what the donut economics model is um, and I'm just making a guess here. Therese, you bet on the wrong horse. I, I did. <laughs> okay. I will say that that when we look back historically, um, communities who have taken opportunities in times of crisis to pause and think and to regroup around what they've done, whether it's been New Orleans, whether it's been Copenhagen when it went bankrupt in um, 1993, whether it's Amsterdam right now, those cities have come out the other side much farther ahead because they've invested a good civic process um, to figure out the future that they want and how to get there. Okay. Um, Do, um, so maybe we'll jump to another question. There were a lot of people um, Therese, commenting. Sorry, I could speak to that briefly if that's helpful. Oh, sure, sure, great. 
Yeah, I am by no means an uh, economist, um, but have had the pleasure of working uh, alongside with Yannick Baudouin, one of the economists at the David Suzuki Foundation. And I do think that the uh, donut economic model is one we should absolutely okay. be um, right. referencing in city building and, and even at the community scale for redevelopment projects. And essentially the shift from our current economic model, which is one of maximize profit um, excluded without really thinking of an upset limit on supply. What the donut economic model does is if you imagine two uh, concentric circles, the, out, the outer aspect of the donut um, is really looking at uh, an ecological ceiling, if you will, and then the inner realm of the donut addresses uh, social issues. And in an ideal uh, donut economic model, you're considering the GDP within the bounds of those two circles. And so what it introduces is two more elements to factor in um, to uh, the economy, which is recognizing that there is an ab the maximum amount of resources available and the imperative benefits in being equitable and um, uh, improving social life uh, for people in conjunction with, uh, with finances. But um, that's a very, very brief answer, but I think it's a great uh, reference. And I would highly recommend that folks pick up the related book on that. Um, and certainly happy to chat offline uh, with anyone else who might be interested. Yeah, and I think there was a great article in The Guardian about it. And I think they also referenced that um, Amsterdam within this model was considering uh, regulating the use of recycled materials and bio-based materials like wood um, and local materials in, um, in their building. So it really is an interesting model. Um, so we're looking at um, what time have we got here? It's we've got um, another four minutes to ask another question. And there's been a lot of comment about um, looking at Europe to models, and we've talked about it a couple examples. Um, oh, and someone just um, put up the Guardian article. Great, thank you. Um, it's on the chat chat box. Um, so. So we talked a little bit about pilot testing and um, you know, the success of the uh, King Street pilot. And um, we also talked about the need um, for pilot, pilot testing going forward um, post COVID. So Kelly Graham, hi Kelly, um, says she loves the idea of, of pilot testing, um, try out new ideas and see if they work. What are some ideas of pilot tests you would like to see in Toronto? Who would like to kick that off? Sure, I'll jump in. It's Pamela. I think, you know, one of the, the opportunities that we have right now when we think about moving forward and piloting innovation is this question of where does the innovation come from? Um, and I think our best post-COVID climate future involves a pilot process where the ideas for things that could work come from communities themselves. People are incredibly knowledgeable about where they live and the things that work and the things that don't and the aspirations that they have. And so I think the city can lead wide scale pilot innovation, but I also hope there'll be an opportunity for grassroots bottom up innovation that can come from small business or come from neighborhood associations or um, from a bunch of neighbors who have an idea about how to make a place to work. We wanna make it as open as possible, but we want things to emerge from places where people actually live there and have a say and have an investment in the future of the pilot project themselves. Right, um, Jenny or Roya, do you wanna comment on that? Sure, um, I can jump in, this is Roya. Um, so, I mean, in the work that I do, the, the, the pilots that I'm thinking about are like very building specific because we have, we have quite a long way to go before we get to those net zero ready buildings and so, finding ways to do like we're looking at finding ways to do more like balcony thermal breaks in our high-rise buildings because we know how important that external envelope is and um, doing little pieces of research with external consultants on what better walls look like and testing them out on our buildings um, or we we actually did a pilot last year where we were looking at how to test um, the air tightness of a building uh, of a high-rise building, which is not new, and it hasn't, it hasn't been done by a lot of developers. So we're, I mean, they're, they're not s super innovative in terms of new. They're things that we know we need to be doing, 
but we're starting to, to make our way into doing more of those little projects and learning from them and really building comfort internally with people. I think that that's the biggest. Great. Jenny, did you want to add to that? I'm um, sure I maybe I'll fall somewhere in between uh, between the uh, the previous two responses. One of the areas that uh, that we're quite keen on, in addition to how do we deliver to Roya's point, how do we deliver something like zero carbon, is we're quite focused on how do we provide or incent food security at the project, the community projects that we're building. Um, and as Pamela mentioned. The, there's so much potential in the communities where we build. And so coming back to this Guelph project, it's just top of mind in, at the Baker District in Guelph, there are, are a ton of experts in uh, urban agriculture and um, active community groups who are delivering um, and providing for food for those in need. And um, we've had a great response from the community um, in terms of how do we bring that expertise to an urban application and use that as a pilot and the city's on board as well to help um, take this uh, basically catalyst thinking that's that will occur and be built out on that project and extend it throughout the city and again that's really coming through that local network of experts the ideas that are already in place are already in their heads are working very well within the local community and and bringing that energy to the developer um, has been a really successful model Wow, so it sounds like you all agree on local community expertise, um, uh, regardless of the scale. Um, so thank you for those for reacting to those questions. And um, unfortunately, we don't have time to um, address some of the other questions. But I just want you to know that we are going to continue with this series. So a lot of your questions um, and comments can inform future topics. For example. Alex Spiegel has written, um, you know, this, the concern that there will be a backlash, people wanting to travel in cars rather than transit. Um, so hopefully we can address that in our transit future of transit series. At the top, we heard from Mike Greer um, thinking about accessible design um, that can be incorporated to open up a new workforce of those with disabilities, and hopefully we can address that in our um, future webinar on um, public public realm and public spaces. So let's wrap up the um, Q&A um, right now. And we're um, going to move to the next slide. And this is just um, some information uh, where you can find um, or track down our excellent panel and um, communicate with them, find out more. So with that, um, I want to extend a warm thank you to the panel. We're so very grateful for your time and your thoughtful expertise today. And so thank you, Roya, Jenny, and Pamela. Thank you, Cherise. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. You guys were so great. I learned so much. And um, our next slide, please. And just to let you know that um, our next um, upcoming um, series or session in, in, in this series is the future of Main Streets, where um, we can start to talk about, um, you know, the challenges, not only that small businesses and local businesses and restaurants and, and shops have experienced, um, but how also this is um, so vital, not just to the businesses, but to our neighborhoods and how important um, main streets are and how they can survive. So that's our next um, session next week. And then our final slide, we're just gonna put a plug in again um, for some upcoming ULI um, webinars. Tomorrow is um, a really a fascinating discussion with Richard Florida. And so I'm looking forward to that. I've signed up for that one. And um, Friday is a pulse check um, webinar um, talking about the future of co-working, which is so fascinating. Where are we at with, you know, um, um, as these spaces are preparing to reopen, um, particularly these co-working spaces where people work really closely together. So um, that'll be really interesting. I tuned in to ULI's pulse check last Friday, which was all about what's going on um, with the real estate sector. And um, that was fascinating as well. 
So if you have um, an appetite for lots of webinars, we've got some coming up. So with that, I want to thank um, ULI for partnering with us on this series. And thank you to all of you um, for joining us with your busy day, making the time to tune in. And we hope you can join us next week. Um, so goodbye until then and take good care.